That music makes me think I'm supposed to have a cape and like jump up onto the stage or something. One of, one of these days, there's some zip line entrance or something. So I don't know. Um, but hey, good morning. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Um, good to be with you. I actually want to uh, invite you uh, to stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, so stand on back up. Uh, our scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 13. Uh, verses 44 through 46, as we continue uh, in our study of the theme of the kingdom of God, or as Matthew, the book of Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Lord, we just thank you for this word, this These two short parables, Lord, from the lips of Jesus himself. God, we're grateful for them. We honor them as your word. We just pray you'd open it to our hearts, our minds, and our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So in April of 2008 in southern Sweden, a nine-year-old boy named Alexander Granhoff and his grandfather went for a walk. They'd been exploring the site of an old battlefield that had recently been plowed, kind of churning up the dirt. Uh, And they they were walking around in hopes of finding an old cannonball or some kind of uh, battle remnants from that battle that had taken place. But what the boy found that day turned out to be far more valuable and interesting than a cannonball. The nine-year-old boy later told reporters, we went out to the field looking for cannonballs. I found a piece of metal, and I thought at first it was a shrapnel from a shotgun. I shouted to grandfather, and then we discovered more and more coins. I'll show you a picture of the boy and his grandfather. In all, the pair found more than 4,600 medieval silver coins. Later, professional archaeologists came with high-tech equipment and unearthed more coins, bringing the total to 7,000 silver coins. Archaeologists nicknamed the discovery Silverado. (laughs) Now, the coins were primarily from Denmark and England, uh, he said, but there were also a number of rare coins from parts of modern-day Germany and the Netherlands. The coins had been placed in two urns and wrapped in cloth and buried under that dirt for centuries and centuries until that little boy found it. It's hard to determine the worth of such a find, but they estimated that if you were to just take take the coins and just melt them down just for the, the silver contained in those coins, it would be worth $250,000. But of course, their value as rare medieval coins, their value because of their archaeology discovery, the rarity of it, makes them worth infinitely more, millions and millions of dollars. And they were just sitting in that field for hundreds of years until the nine-year-old boy found them. Kind of makes you all want to go home and dig up holes in your backyard, huh? (laughs) That's how we'll pay down uh, our church debt loan, right? (laughs) Everyone dig a hole in your yard. I used to think that buried treasure was just something that pirates do. You're like, what were the pirates doing in southern Sweden in medieval times? But actually, uh, it was actually a common practice for quite a lot of human history to hide treasure underground. Because for most of the world and most of human history, there was both an absence of a trustworthy banking system and constant threat of either bandits or invading armies. 
So we live in a time in which we, we enjoy uh, peace and security in our country and a thriving banking system. So probably not that many of us think to bury it. But when you live in an area in which there were bands of thieves, no safe banks, and potential of a foreign army invading, like what we see happening in Ukraine now, uh, or even just at a time in which the local tax collector was rumored to be in your county, people all over the world had the practice of, quick, bury our wealth, hide it somewhere, and then when the army or the tax man has passed, we dig it back up. Now, most of the time, it worked out, and they were able to go remember uh, and retrieve their money when the trouble passed. But sometimes, sometimes something else happened. Every once in a while, the person would forget where they buried it. Oh, right. Or something would happen to them. Perhaps they were killed in that war sweeping through or some disaster happened or the tree that marked their, their hiding spot was burned down. Who knows what could happen? But every once in a while, the treasure would just be lost. Imagine the frustration with that, right? But for whatever reason, sometimes the buried treasure would not get unearthed and just sat there somewhere in the dirt for generations until someone disturbed that exact spot where it lay. Now, in Jesus' day, there were all kinds of stories like this that would take place, and all of the stories of finding buried treasure that were told in Jesus' day all had to do with someone plowing a field. That was the only way that they really disturbed dirt. Their construction, you know, just kind of went on top of the dirt. So the plowing was the thing that would unearth something. Today we find something, we often hear discoveries of, of archaeological finds going on from a subway dig or something like that. But for in Jesus' day, it was the plowing of a field. This seems to be what's happening in the first parable, right? Jesus says, a kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. So a man finds a treasure in a field that he does not already own. Most likely, he's a hired laborer who is paid to plow the field of a landowner to prepare it for planting. He's not looking for anything. He's just going about his daily grind, working the plow. Now, if he's lucky, maybe he has an ox or a donkey to pull the plow. Otherwise, he's just using some kind of hand plow to work the soil. Either way, it's a tough and thankless job out there under the sun all day working the plow. And then, bam, he hits something hard. Now, the soil in Israel, I've mentioned to you earlier in the series, is very, very rocky. You see kind of rocky soil as kind of a, a theme that comes up in Jesus' teaching. The, the Israelite farmers used to have jokes about how rocky it is. Like the, in creation, there was an accident, and the angel with all the rocks uh, accidentally dropped a third of the world's rocks on the farms of Israel, right? Uh, and so the farmers were always complaining about this angel that dropped all these rocks. And so probably the plowman's like, hits on the rock. He's like, oh my gosh, that clumsy angel that dropped the rocks. And, uh, um, but yet he bends down and he finds something really different, right? You can imagine he's plowing, uh, boom. He's like, oh, I gotta remove this rock. And he's like, whoa. You imagine that moment when he's like, that's not a rock. And he gets down there and he's like, oh, 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 right? You guys have a happy dance? Do you guys, does anybody have a, you guys have a happy, anybody want to model their happy dance for us? I don't know about you, but, but, but when I'm watching the 49er game, like my family has this sort of routine every touchdown. And for some reason I get this wide stance and I go, waka, 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 waka. I don't know. I can't control it. It's not a great dance, but it happens every time. And then Abigail runs up and grabs my hands and does like this spinning flip off my chest. I mean, that's just walk, walk, a flip. I mean, every touchdown, right? So the guy, you imagine the guy is like, he's plowing, he's sweaty, and he, he finally he's like, you know, something, right? <laughs> something happens, and he's just, oh, I see, I see. We got some, you know, some different, different dances. He's dancing, he's cheering. He's like, this is unbelievable. I just found treasure in the dirt, right? Enough to make him an incredibly rich man. But then he comes to his senses after he's like, whoa, he's, yeah, 
he realizes, uh oh, there might be rivals for my treasure, right? He's like, I don't own this field. The guy that owns this field might lay some legal claim. Hey, it's my field, it's my treasure, man, back off. It's like, oh my gosh, I need to own the field. And then he realizes there's other workers maybe that might see me dancing. They're, they never see me dancing in the plow field, so I, I, they might come running over. You guys ever like, been, you guys ever like done the pinata thing? I've done the pinata thing a bunch with my kids, you know, and anytime like you, you tell the kids, okay, listen, somebody smashes the pinata. Don't everyone go diving for the candy, right? It doesn't matter what you tell the kids, what happens? They go diving for the candy, right? I remember in high school, this kind of noontime activity thing, we had a pinata and I was the one with the blindfold and I just smashed the heck out of that pinata, right? And uh, like hundreds of people came, came just running. So by the time I got my blindfold out, like off, there was like a hundred people all fighting for the, for the thing. There was this one guy who was like the noontime helper, helping the, the lady who was running the things. And he, he, he thought it was his job to defend the pinata candy and he threw his body on top of the candy. He's like, no, one at a time. And he got all tore up, okay? <laughs> you, know? you don't want to throw your body on pinata candy, okay? But maybe the guy's thinking, all right, the owner, he could take it from me. The other, the other field workers, they might run over and have this like, you know, mad pinata ride and everyone takes it. No, 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 I got to play it cool, right? So he plays it cool, so he, he puts it back in the ground. Oh, just a rock, just a rock, no problem, you know? And then, then you know what he has to do? He has to play it cool for the rest of the day. But he's, he's not a professional actor, right? So it probably looks something like this, right? It's probably like, uh, he finds it. He's like, whoa! Oh, you guys got to cover it up, right? And then you know what he's probably doing? He's probably like skipping as he... <laughs> You know, he's probably like, da, 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 I'm a rich man. And people are like, what? Da. He's like, yeah, you know, he's fired up. And you can't wait, well, he probably plowed that field faster than any day in his life, right? He plowed that field and then he, then he gets home, right? And, and I don't know if he's married. Jesus doesn't say whether he's married or not, but if he is married, I think he's got to have a conversation with his wife. It's something like this. Hey, wife, hey, 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 wife, get, check it out. I was plowing today. I found a treasure. We're going to be rich. But the only thing is, I don't own the field, so we got to sell all our stuff so I could buy it. We're going to sell the chickens. We're going to sell the donkey. We're going to sell all your clothes. We're going to sell the house. Everything's got to go tonight, baby. And then we're going to go buy that field and get rich rich. All right. Now, I don't know how your marriage works, <laughs> but if I was to come and say this to, to Joy, I would have some serious explaining to do, right? I have to tell her the story about like, I, there, I, there I was, I did my happy dance. And then like, she's like, you did your happy dance while farming? Yeah. You know? And then, and, and then you just tell the story and then you, and then you imagine the emotional roller coaster that you'd be on that night. As, you, as you're excited about, oh my gosh, we could have a treasure. Our lives would be totally different. But you're also mourning the loss. Wow, I got to sell my chickens. You know, I got to sell my, everything, everything, everything. Can we sell half? No, we got to sell everything to buy this field. But it's going to be worth it. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is just like that. The kingdom of God is that treasure in the field. Maybe you weren't looking for it. Maybe, maybe you had no idea the kingdom of God was a treasure. Maybe at first you thought it was a rock. Pfft, kingdom of God, that Jesus, he's no treasure, he's just a rock. But somehow, Something hit you. You weren't looking for Jesus. You weren't looking for a salvation plan. You weren't looking for heaven. You weren't looking for a philosophy of life. You were minding your own business, just pursuing the American dream. And then all of a sudden you stumbled on Jesus and you're like, whoa, this is a treasure. 
Jesus then goes on to tell another parable that functions like a twin of the first one. He talks about a pearl merchant. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. Now, the key difference, there's a lot of similarities between these two. The key difference is in the first one, the farmer, he is not looking for treasure, right? He's just trying to do his job. He's minding his business. And then he finds treasure. But the pearl merchant is someone who's looking for treasure. Their whole life revolves around finding treasure. I don't know for you if that means, does that mean you're a philosopher? Does that mean you just are passionate about figuring out the meaning of life? Does that mean for you that you're someone who just really, really cares about what are you gonna invest your life into? What, what matters in this world? I don't know what that's gonna be for you, but, but there's farmers that stumble upon it and there's pearl merchants that go looking for it. Now some background on pearl merchants. So the pearl is the natural product of oysters. You can show, uh, I think we have some pictures here. It was the most valued item in the ancient Near East world. It was thought to be one of the most beautiful objects on earth. And in antiquity, pearls were much more difficult to obtain. There's no oyster farms, no modern diving equipment, very dangerous. I'll show you some other pictures. This is actually some people who do it in similar ways today. The way they did it at Jesus' time, they tied a rock to their feet and jumped out of small vessels And the rock on the rope would pull you down to the bottom. You just hold your breath. You hope you don't get eaten by a shark. All right, you hope you don't go too deep and pop. All right, you hope you can cut the rope before you run out of breath. And you hope that in your precious few seconds on the floor of the sea that you're able to scoop up an oyster that just happens to have a valuable pearl inside. And pearls function in the day kind of like diamonds do today. Anybody ever bought a diamond? Okay, I have bought one in my life, okay? I bought one diamond for an engagement ring. And uh, when I went in there, it's like, I just need something shiny, right? They're like, no, 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 no. We need to teach you about the four C's. You guys know the four C's? See, they teach you about carrot and cut and clarity and color. For just those 30 minutes to five hours, they turn you into a diamond aficionado, okay? They, they give you a microscope to look at tiny imperfections to, to get you to kind of spend more and more and more, to get you to appreciate, right, just the rarity of what you're going to do. Well, the, well, the pearls were the same way, right? The rarity of it, the, 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 the nuances of it, the formation, the size, all those things affected the price. And they were the collection, a, a fine pearl was this prized collection that royalty and very, very rich people would, would, would buy as, as sound investments and as, as, as treasured beauties. And there were middlemen that would go on behalf of these uber wealthy people and of this royalty searching for fine pearls. And they'd go and, and connect with the divers, the people who are out there finding them, searching the markets for that one rare, precious pearl. And one day this merchant, who's an expert in finding quality pearls, he finds one pearl of such incredible quality, such majestic beauty that it just takes his breath away. And he says, I found it at last. I have to have it. And it's so valuable in his expert opinion that he's willing to go home and liquidate his assets. He sells all of his other pearls. He sells the donkey he rode in on. He sells his little magnifying glass, his, his pearl evaluation kit. He sells it all so he can just have enough to buy that one pearl. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is just like that. 
Now, I don't know if we have any investment brokers in the room, but if we do, you're probably screaming inside, that's not a sound investing policy, right? You wanna diversify your portfolio, mitigate your risk. But Jesus is not here teaching us how to manage our 401k. He's teaching us how to manage our life. And he's saying, find something worth betting on and then go all in with it. And he's telling us what that thing is. Sometimes life calls for a gamble. Now, I'm not a big poker player, okay? Uh, But I once joined a weekly men's poker night when I lived in Ghana. Some of you wonder, what do missionaries in Africa do on Tuesday nights? (laughs) We play poker. Now, on our budgets and on our values, the maximum buy-in was always $1, okay? It's five CDs, so it was the most you could possibly lose was $1. We just wanted to have the fun and the fellowship. But I remember in that game with this high stakes, if there's five of us, it was a total of $5. It could be one, right? And I would remember the moment in which uh, these were, these were all, uh, all missionaries. I remember TK the Ghanaian director of a ministry to street children would look at his hand, he'd look at us and he would say, I'm all in. And he would slide his entire pile of chips worth 73 cents to the middle. I would fold, right? I'm, a, I, I'm like, ah, I, I, I'm a coward here, I, I'm, I'm gonna fold. And then uh, we would ooh and ah at TK's courage And then we'd have uh, the director of this evangelistic radio uh, 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 ministry, he would fold. But then Steve, the director of investigation for IJM, who's a seasoned undercover police officer from the US, he looks at his hand, he looks at TK, and he says, I'm all in. We're like, whoa. There's now at least a dollar and 46 in the pods. (laughs) Holy smoke. And then they look at each other like they're on a Western movie. They'd be like, let's show our cards. And they throw down their cards. And only one man smiles, right? And then one man goes home. <laughs> but the thing that I learned from these experiences in missionary poker is that when you know you have a good bet, that's when you can go all in with it. And Jesus tells us there's a moment in life in which you discover something that is so valuable that you're willing to go all in. And he says that treasure, that pearl, is the kingdom of God. Anything else is a stupid bet. He actually tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, don't spend yourselves on behalf of treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but instead invest yourselves in treasures of heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But when you find that heavenly treasure, you can go all in with it. Whether you're the pearl merchant who's been looking for it or the farmer who just, you know, the the plowman who just stumbled on it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing to think about. In the story, finding is different than having, right? The story doesn't just say they found something of infinite worth and then they had it. There was this process of selling before they were able to have it. T.S. Eliot said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And there's this sort of selling and this exchange that happens there. But the thing is, these guys, when they find this treasure, they don't want to later 
tell their grandkids the story of that time I found a treasure in the field and I got scared, so I just walked on by. And the pearl merchant doesn't want to tell his grandkids the story. I found that pearl. I wonder who has it today. Oh, they want to have it. They want to have it. But in both cases, both people had to go home, sell everything they had in order to obtain that treasure. And so I'm sharing with you about the cost of discipleship. Jesus actually does inform us the gift of grace, the gift of the gospel is a free gift. And yet there's also this cost in our lives when we grab a hold of it. And I want us to understand the cost of the kingdom. When Jesus says things like, he who would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It means there's gonna be a cost if you become a citizen of the kingdom, if you grab a hold of that treasure. Okay, so here's what's interesting about the price, the price of obtaining the treasure. The plowman and the fine pearl merchant, they are not on the same socioeconomic level, okay? The pearl merchant is significantly richer than the plowman. But in both cases, the price of the treasure is exactly equal to everything they have. And that's not by, by an accident, right? Uh, uh, Jesus, as he's telling the story, he could have made the price of the, obtaining the treasure just too high, right? So the story could have been, a man is plowing a field. You know, he finds a treasure in his field. He goes home. He sells everything he has to buy that field, but it just wasn't enough. But that's not how the story goes, is it? Or Jesus could have made the price lower. The pearl merchant, he found this pearl of great price. It was amazing. And he had enough in petty cash to cover the price. So it's great. He got rich. Isn't that interesting? In both stories, the price of obtaining the treasure is exactly equal to everything that person has. Whether they're rich or the poor, everything they have is the price of obtaining that treasure. The kingdom of God costs something to those who would Obtain it. Now, what are we not talking about? We are absolutely not talking about writing a check and buying your way into the kingdom. None of us can write that check. The bill, if we were to write a check, it would bounce. Okay? We're not talking about earning your salvation with good deeds. None of us can do that. So, what is the cost? Okay, to figure out what the cost is in our life, I want to take you back as we've, as we've kind of been going through uh, the, this series, we've sort of been able to put some definitions on what the kingdom of God is. So let's start with what is the kingdom of God? And we've said that the kingdom of God is equal to everything that's under the reign and the power and the will of God, Right? So everything that submits to God, everything that's sort of owned by God, the things that, 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 that the ways of God, the people who obey God, it's everything under the power of God that's actively submitting to God is the kingdom of God. What do the plowman and the pearl merchant sell? They sell everything that is under their power and possession. Do you get that? They sell their kingdom. The price of obtaining the treasure of the kingdom of God is exactly equal to giving up their entire kingdom. What does that mean for us? It means that we cannot have God for our king while still insisting that we will be king over our kingdom. We don't get to say, Jesus, I wanna be part of your kingdom. And I'm gonna be completely king of mine. Jesus says, I wanna give you 
a share in my kingdom. This, this, this thing that we've been talking about all through this study, this, this active reigning power of God that does miracles, that brings healing, that does restoration, that transforms society, that can, that can overcome uh, uh, evil and addiction and sickness and death and bring you into a life of love and justice and, and harmony that lasts forever. I wanna share that with you. But to have God for your king you're gonna have to give up being king yourself. And none of you is too rich or too poor to obtain that field. There's a gift that's being offered to you. That treasure is laid in your path. That pearl of great price is is, is put right in front of your sight. Here, I want to give you this. But it equals us saying, oh God, I surrender my own kingship. I liquidate my assets, my my own power over my small sphere. I give it up, I give it to you. I'd like you to imagine a scenario in which you're walking down Park Victoria later today. You happen to stumble on, (laughs) Elon Musk is walking down the other way. Like, whoa, whoa. Elon, I thought you moved to Texas. He's like, well, I did, you know, but I come back and visit now and then and I've been looking for you. You're like, really, you're looking for me? He says, yeah, 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 I got a business proposition for you. I'd like to share everything I own with you if you'd be willing to share everything you own with me. Like your, you know, like your house and your car and stuff. I'll share with you, you know, I'll share with you my business, my house and car. And w- w- would, you, w- would you make that trade? I mean, now maybe if it was me walking down the street, you'd think twice. But you're like, yeah, this guy, you know, uh, it might be a pretty good deal, okay? But what we're talking about with Jesus is so much better of a deal than that. We're talking about the king of the universe. We're talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who has power to overcome all the evil in this world and all the death and all the suffering and all the sin, saying, I I, I want you to be part of my kingdom. I want you to share in this infinite joy. But would you be willing to lay down your own kingship? Because we can only have one king in this kingdom. Deal or no deal? (laughs) This is the question that we face. For Jesus, the kingdom is not a doctrine. It's a treasure. It's a relationship. It's an incredible opportunity to lay down our kingship, to take up his. And it's a bet that you can go all in on and that you will never, ever, ever regret. I wanna lead us in a prayer and then we will come to the Lord's table. And the prayer I wanna lead you in is a prayer of, uh, of this, of, 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 of this guy's making the, or lady, whoever this is, is making a choice, right? Am I, am I willing to go all in for this? Am I willing to sell everything I have, buy the field, get the treasure? And for those of us who are Christians, we, we, have, we, have, we have taken that. We've said, yeah, Lord, you're my king. And so I just wanna lead us in a prayer. It's an opportunity for you to come before the Lord Jesus and offer that. Lord God, we just, we come before you today. And right now we, re- we recognize that you are a treasure. And Lord, right now, we just lay down all that we have, all that we are, all our small ambitions, all our territorial desire. We don't wanna be the kings and queens of our own life, our own turf anymore because we love you and we trust you. And we invite you to be the king, the Lord, and the savior of our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, Just a great joy to, to be with you. Hear now this benediction, this blessing. May Jesus Christ himself, 
the one who gave himself on the cross, the one who is the broken bread, the poured out cup. May that Lord, may that Jesus be your savior and rescue you from all that oppresses you. And may that same Jesus also be your guide, your shepherd, your Lord, and your King. Amen.